Good morning, everyone. This morning I'm going to be recording an up-to-date touch IC video. Um, it's been a while since I've done just like a straight routine touch IC video that's not, hopefully not, a previous repair attempt. And I know you may be disappointed to see another touch IC video, but uh, that's that's what I got to work <laughs> work with right now. And uh, my last touch IC videos, they 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 really suck. Um, I'm going to switch my camera here so you can see my hands and all my black spots. I've tried a couple of different blue mats now and the very fact that they bubble underneath when you get them too hot makes it a real pain in my ass. So, first thing I'm going to do is tear this down. I'm going to tear it down on camera. Hopefully autofocus doesn't drive you mad. Here's where I should cue the techno music, speed up the video, whoops, but I'm not going to. Now this is not a phone that has gray bars. Um, this is a phone that only has no touch. That's all I get. Just no touch. There we go. First thing I'm doing is disconnecting the battery, the A node. The positive line in the backlight circuit. Um, where's my customer? Oh, right here. Stays hot all the time. So um, even if the phone is off and you start to put a connector on there and it's a little crooked and you get ground across that A node, um, it's still going to pop it. And then it will wind up needing board repair. So, let's grab a test screen. Now what I'm doing here, I'm making sure this isn't a screen problem. I'm trying to make sure it isn't a screen problem anyway. It usually is touch IC failure, but um, once in a while it's not, and it's usually the original Apple screen that ha that has problems. So when I have a phone that comes in here with an original Apple screen and Touch IC failure with gray bars, it's like, oh man, this sucks because um, a lot of times you'll get the Touch IC fixed, or the Touch IC is fixed, and then the screen itself is a piece of shit. And the way I test it, I'll lift it up off the phone, I'll lift it up off the phone just a little bit like this, and then I'll f I'll kind of flex the screen a bit. Um, and that will cause um, the screen to fritz out, and that's how I narrow down the faulty Apple screen. So um, I guess I could test it on another phone before doing the Touch IC replacement. You know what? I might start doing that. Test it on another phone before the Touch IC replacement, and then I can tell the customer before I ever start, hey, this one's going to need a screen too. Because what I've been doing, I've been running, in, running into it after I do the repair, and then I gotta contact them and say, "Hey, I gotta, I gotta put a screen on this one too." You said you don't do screen replacements. I know what you're all thinking, but in that situation, you've already mailed the phone all the way to me. It's all the way here, kids. And if I've got one on hand, it makes sense for me just to go ahead and put it on the phone. Um, now, if I don't have one on hand and you're stuck waiting for me to order them then it don't make much sense because you could get your phone back and head over to and head over to a local shop and get it replaced faster than you can wait on me to get them in stock fix it and then send it to you it's you know several days faster if i just send it back Now, this is not an exact science of a repair. These phones are not all the same. They behave differently. You can do the same job exactly the same over and over and over all day long. 
and you run into a certain subset of different behaviors out of these phones, um, and sometimes once in a great while you'll bump into a complete new situation. It's like, what the fuck? And the vibrator popped off my coax on this one, so I went ahead and take it out. I usually just leave it hooked onto the coax and kind of fold it back out of the way a little bit. Come on. These phones have a way of knowing when I try to do a video. I'm seeing a little sticky on the sticker there around the connectors. It bothers the shit out of me because I'd say 50% of the touch IC jobs that come through here are previous attempts. And those are the ones that go wrong. Like this one, I don't know if you've seen what just happened, but I pulled the board out and this antenna cable is not hooked up. Oh look, and I flip it over and the sticker's been tampered with. Wait a minute. Never mind, it's got tape under it. They watched that video. So let's kick the housing out of the way. I'm going to grab a sticker, stick on the bottom of this board. This dude. Whoa. B in the building. Ah! As long as they just put tape over it and didn't take the Wagner heat gun to it. Man, I've had so many of these boards come in here that people have heated with something outrageous. I think some of them maybe even use like a gas torch or something. I stopped using any kind of heat to take these stickers off. It's just, if you pull them slow enough, they don't leave any residue. I'm not worried about the residue. I'm worried about putting the sticker back on it. Okay. All right, folks. Now, the main purpose for me doing another Touch IC video is for me to do an updated Touch IC video. And by updated touch IC video, I want to talk about some of the facts that go along with this repair. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get my hot air set and keep this moving because the only way I'm able to do a video right now is if I'm doing a video of an actual repair. Um, I just, I have too much coming through here to fiddle around. I, I do have some fun stuff planned though. Um, I got some pretty cool stuff planned that'll, that'll just be for fun. Um, I'm not going to give any of that, that away right now. So anyways, I'm going to keep working here. Um, I'm going to give you my microscope so that you can see what I'm doing. Got my fucking glasses because that, that ain't never going to work. Okay. Now while I work, I'd like to talk about the return rate on this repair. The first video that I ever published ever posted oh boy I'm doing this on camera so I've already got a little case of the jitters I'm gonna start warming this board up here the first video that I ever posted was bragging about um, our return rate and how I'm not running into any of the defects a lot of these other shops are doing and I think I may have did a little bit of a video since then and re-talked about some of that stuff but um, I take all the precautions possible to keep from having these things come back and still I've got a return rate there's a little bit of tape funk there I still uh, maintain a, a certain amount of return on these things um, I'd say somewhere between five on uh, you know five to ten percent sometimes less sometimes a little more um, so there's a pretty hefty return rate that comes along with this repair now, okay, I think we're preheated. I'm going to move right in on that dude for the kill. I see this little inductor melting. That means we're close. And we're up. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and pull the Broadcom IC. Now there are still certain situations where I'm going to change Mason only. But 
most situations uh, this is my first repair for this morning I'm here at I came in at 6 this morning I was trying to get here by 5 um, so I, I've got a little little case of the jitters not much we'll get the job done today um, gosh I totally forgot where I was at this is this is just this is gonna turn out awful <laughs> so anyways I'm doing all that I can to keep these from coming back um, I replace both ICs and in some cases I will only do Mason rare cases um, I try to switch as much of the solder on the pads over to leaded as I can and I try to do a good job soldering the chips back onto it I have had customers ask me to underfill it in which my response is no way in hell um, and the reason why I wouldn't underfill it is because this repair sometimes you can get it done all the way done and do nothing but put the board back in the phone and have flickering gray bars again after all that work and ultrasonic cleaning and dry time and soldering and have gray bars again right after you put it back in the phone so what are you gonna do I mean you've you've just glued the chip to the board no way in hell I'm underfilling this shit no <laughs> no way so you know I'd say one or two out of ten of them do that so what's that deal is it defective IC is it the very fact that you heating the chip or something you know heating something near it is what got rid of the gray bars to start with there's all these different behaviors that you can get even though you do a consistent repair and do it the same every every time you can get different behaviors out of this stuff I'm gonna have a real hard time staying on topic I have to restock my q-tips I'll be right back okay I'm back with you here I've got cumulus and mason both off of the board and I'm gonna clean up our site here so I guess what I'm getting to here I'm definitely not gonna underfill the chips because so often you can get the job all the way done that is solder right there you can get the job all the way done and wind up having to go back in and replace or you'll find one line of touch that's that's not hitting or, or you know a little checkered pattern that you can't get rid of by a screen replacement and all of those things that I just described to you are typically Mason IC defects so that if you get the job all the way done and you run into one of these defects you're gonna be changing Mason again and if you've glued the son of a bitch to the board you're gonna have a real hard time doing that so no I'm, I'm not gonna underfill them um, another question that I'm getting asked a lot is what do you do to prevent this from happening in the future well what I found out is that a phone that is gonna have this resurface it is gonna resurface no matter what you do to it and I can almost guarantee that every other micro soldering shop on the planet that's trying to do this repair is running into that same you know the same conclusion um, if somebody out there has found something definitively that keeps this from resurfacing I, I would love to hear about it um, because I, I, I've came to the point where I think sometimes it's defective ICs it's the actual IC that's broken sometimes it's the board um, you know sometimes there's something broken in the board sometimes there's a broken trace that you can't see um, let me try to give you a, I'm just I'm probably not doing a very good video because I'm not paying attention to what you are seeing I'm just ranting about this repair so you can see I've, I've cleaned this up pretty good now all I've done was drug a blob of leaded solder around that with in the presence of plenty of flux and shined all these pads up good there's a couple of them there that are a little dull um, but I'm not I'm not gonna nitpick this is all looking really good so I'm gonna hit it with a little more alcohol here and boy, one of the next upgrades I'm doing here is you know HDMI capture 
um, to get rid of some of the compression on this camera and then eventually I'll replace that camera and try to give you guys a clearer picture but yeah so I get asked that a lot are, are you putting the shield on the back of the board and here is what I did with that shield now I'll, I'll admit at first I was really hopeful I mean, I, I was really hopeful. I was like, oh, this is, this is great. These things finally, I'm not going to have any returns anymore. And I started putting it on boards. And I bet I put it out there on 50 of them. And what I came up with is that I still got some returns, and the returns came in, and my plan was, okay, these are going to be ones that I didn't put the shield on because I didn't document which ones I did and which ones I didn't. And I started getting phones back once in a while, you know, not not a lot. I got a really good return rate. I don't get a lot of these things back. Um, where's my ICs? Touch IC video, and I can't find any ICs. Okay. So I still got my, my returns, and as I would open them up, my plan was, okay, better future shield them, I and I'd open them up, and I already have it on there. And I started trying to keep closer track and I started doing them both ways. I'd do them with them without, with them without, and I started alternating back and forth, and I just, I reached a point where I was just beating my head against the wall. Plus, I had to start insulating those shields because when people would push the back of the phone just right, they could actually get in, especially phones that were bent, they could get in and cause my shield to contact the board, um, the components on it. So I decided no more metal plate. It, it wasn't helping me. It was taking a whole bunch of time. But um, maybe mine wasn't, my, maybe my plates weren't thick enough. I, I don't know. But I, I sure tried hard. All right, I'm getting my Broadcom IC turned the way I need it to for this repair. Now I'm. I, the first flux I used here is a water soluble flux from Chipquick that I'm kind of starting to hate. I used SMD 4300 TF10. Um, this flux is highly corrosive. If you don't have an ultrasonic cleaner, I do not, I don't know if you can read this or not, but I do not recommend this flux if you don't have an ultrasonic cleaner because you can't leave this shit on the board. It, it, it'll, it'll eat it alive. So. Um, I use it because it cleans up really easy with alcohol. I take the chips off, clean the pads off, this wipes away easy. I'm going to use, to install the chips, I'm going to use SMD 291. What? Wife's messing with me this morning. Okay, so to install the chips, I'm going to use SMD 291. Um, it's a tacky flux from Chipquick, and I like it. This is actually one of the original fluxes I ever started using, but it's a pain in the ass to clean up cold. Um, you have to hold the board hot, and then you can clean it up with alcohol. And um, Anyways, I use this to put the chips on because it works really good. You can, you'll probably be able to see why in this video whenever I do Mason. It'll actually lock the chip in place to where you can let it go and then heat it and don't have to worry about blowing the chip off the board. Okay, this is going to be a ridiculously long Touch IC video because I, I keep getting sidetracked and I, I have a lot of stuff going on. So, when a phone comes in here for repair, this is its normal course of action. I mean, th this is what I do to them. Um, I replace both of these ICs and I try to look for anything else that could be causing loss of touch. Um, So anyways, no underfill and no metal shield for me, because if I can fix them, I can fix them. If I can't, I can't. If one goes out and has a problem, we typically have the customer send it back once. And once in a while, I'll find where I didn't form this board up a little more. 
I'll find where I didn't solder mason on properly. You know, it, it'll be a little raised up on one end, and I'll go ahead and replace it. You know, once in a while, that's the case. Um, so a lot of times, if it does get returned, that second trip takes care of it. And if the second trip doesn't take care of it, you're not getting rid of this problem. Unless you know something that nobody else does, you just you won't get rid of it. If it's resurfaced twice, unless you're doing just like a... That's taking too long. There it goes. Unless you just... We're on. Unless you just don't know what you're doing, after the second time, it, it, it's done. I mean, you're just... It's not an issue with the ICs. There's something else going on. So I'm going to use the same flux on Mason. Quite a bit different going on since the board's hot. I should have had Mason out already. My Mason strip is empty. I did have one out. <laughs> Alright, I got audio back. Yes, we have audio. Okay. I'm inspecting the bottom of these ICs to make sure all of their balls are there. Chips that don't have enough balls don't typically work. I don't like the little amount of flux that I see laying over here, so I'm going to go ahead and add a little more. Okay. Yeah, so it, it kills me when somebody says, what do you do to keep this from coming back? And it's like, man, because I know there are lots of others that are offering things and promises of it not coming back, but it don't. All right, focus. Okay. And see that flux actually holds that chip on the board pretty solid, see? And now I'm free to heat it. Now you don't have to get it directly on the pads, but you gotta get it pretty damn close. If you're not close enough, it'll jump off to the side and you'll wind up a full row out and then all hell's going to break loose. This one here is pretty on the money. We're on up here, down here, we're on up here. That chip is good to go. Yeah, so it really kills me when people ask what are you doing to prevent it because I've tried all the tricks to prevent this and the phones that are going to come back still come back. Um, oh look this is one of those that has the strip of glue now nine times out of ten the ones that have that strip I don't have any other problems out of man this thing has had a lot of plugging going on here look at this thing it's kind of chewed up yeah the ones that have this strip of glue on them I don't have a lot of problems out of them so the phones that are going to come back, they come back. They come back if I have them shielded. They come back. Um, they, 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 they come back if they're going to come back. They're just they're going to come back. Oh, let me move my water damage indicator. So I no longer do the shield. No underfill. I think that's the main topics I wanted to cover in this video. But ultimately, I. I gotta keep things moving here. Alright, let the board cool down a little more, grab a test housing. So what I did looks simple to a lot of people. Now if you're thinking about doing this repair, don't do it on your own phone that you need the pictures off of or you need to take to work or school tomorrow. Or um, If this is your first one, if it's your first time doing any kind of micro soldering, it's most likely... What the... Oh. It's not all the way in the housing, right? It's most likely not going to work out for you. What? No, now I'm going to look like an idiot. What's going on here? Okay. Alright, this battery in my test housing worked for a couple months and died. Plug another battery in. 
just in case this board is passworded. I'm gonna, and I don't have the password, I'm going to plug the antenna in. If I don't have a passcode, I'll connect that bottom antenna and throw a SIM card in it and call the phone. And that's how I test as much as I can. Well, Apple logo, that's, that's a pretty good sign. Right off the bat, I'm looking for gray bars. I'm pushing on the board. Or any bars, anything to happen, flicker, flash, reboot. So after you've done this repair, there's a lot of other things that pop up that are normal for people that are doing this repair. Um, you can wind up with um, no cameras. You can wind up with a proximity sensor that don't work, um, ear speaker that don't work, ambient light sensor that don't work. There's all these things that you can wind up with that, that don't work. Um, and that's stuff that makes this job a pain in the ass. On a routine basis, I'm doing right now five to seven phones is what I lay out. I have them all tore down in front of me, each with separate magnet pads each with with tags on everything and I always keep track of who goes where um, so on a routine day I can blaze through these things really quick but with touch IC failures every other one or every other few is gonna have a secondary failure um, something that doesn't work since you replace the touch ICs now that one took a minute. Are we still booting or are we having failure? Or is this my screen? No, this is touch IC issues. So a lot of these go routine, but some of them don't. Like this one here. barely any working touch. Now, is this my chips? Is it the board? Did my screen not plug all the way in? Screen's plugged in pretty good. So, first thing I'm going to do is grab another screen and make sure it's not my screen. <laughs> so, on a routine day, you can blast through these things. Um, you know, I can do five to seven in a day, but what makes them tricky is the secondary defects. Once you get it done, you have to fix a proximity sensor or figure out why something doesn't work. And it makes this repair take forever. Let this thing boot. Um, I have a lot of people that are contacting me and wanting to send me a higher volume of these things and they're wanting to send me a higher volume of them in exchange for less money and my answer to that right now is no way no way in hell there are so many so many of these coming in that it's difficult for me to get them all done and issues like this make them take forever it's just my screen look at that yep okay so the screen I grabbed doesn't have any of the goodies. So let's go ahead and check touch fully here to make sure the board's okay. What I do is I grab a fixed point and touch here and hold it. And then I'll take my other hand and I'm actually going to push on the board. And what I'm trying to do is get it to drop touch. And I'm pushing all around everywhere. See, we don't drop touch. This thing is still stable. So I know I don't have any cold solder joints. Trolled by a bad screen this morning. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to switch this over to the customer screen. It's the original Apple screen that once in a while also has a defect, like pretty frequently. It's to the point where whenever I I do this job and I see that that's the original Apple screen, I'm just like, oh, fuck. Because I don't like doing screen replacements. We, I quit doing screen replacements and have not looked back. So people can bitch about the defect rate all they want on touch IC failure, but it's not that much worse than the defect rate on screens. Hell, it might even be better. There is a defect rate, but there's a defect rate on just about everything that you do in this business. And everybody's doing everything they can to try to steer away from those defects. But once in a while, they, they still get you. 
All right, let's boot up on the customer screen since this has working everything else, hopefully. Proximity sensor, ear speaker. And let's see if I can test this phone. Do I, have, I do have a passcode on this one. We're gonna test this one. Yeah, I really just wanted to walk you all through a routine touch IC replacement. Now, I'm realizing more and more that there are many people watching these videos that are trying to do exactly what I'm doing. I don't know why I didn't expect that. I'm an idiot. Um, so, I do lose some sleep at night for the people that have watched my videos and then destroyed your phones. I, I just, I feel terrible for it. I, I, I feel somewhat at fault. So, um, if you are going to do this repair, do it on something not important. Learn on something that's not important first. All right, so this screen seems to behave okay. To check to see if their screen is okay, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna grab it here, and I'm gonna lightly bend that screen like this. It's good. The uh, original Apple screens that had the defect that I'm talking about, that motion there causes them to drop touch. That, we drop touch here, we're a screen. If we drop touch here, we're aboard and I don't drop touch anywhere so this one is looking very promising all right so let's test a couple of things on this phone oh boy now the customer is going to know it's their phone all right I'm going to test just a few things here. We're going to do proximity sensor. I'm checking the audio input on the audio IC. Here's proximity sensor. Proximity sensor is working. Okay. I'm going to rewind this and I'm going to play it back. I'm going to make sure I can hear it through the ear speaker. Ear speaker works. Loudspeaker. Oops. I keep triggering the proximity sensor. Does the loudspeaker work? Yay, we have loudspeaker. So our audio IC, codec IC is seemingly okay. I'm going to go in and I'm going to verify Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi antenna is not hooked up, but it will allow me to enable it. So Wi-Fi is working. If I walk over right by the hotspot, it'll light up. Um, so Wi-Fi is working. I'm going to check back and front camera there's some weird shit that goes on with these cameras sometimes um, next let's see okay I would go ahead and test Siri right now but I'm sidetracked and I have no connection but this phone's gonna be fine um, I'm gonna go ahead and slide to power off So I have a lot of people asking me to do volume and, and bulk and, and do this cheaper, and I just, I won't. Um, this one's turning out okay, but one of these times here I'm going to sit down to do a video on this repair, and you'll get a good taste of one that don't turn out okay. Um, there's some weird stuff that can happen. The front, the camera issue, if it's both cameras that don't work, it, it's not too bad. It's, it's a little LDO that drives the cameras. Now, the same LDO drives both cameras. The, there's one one chip that supplies power to both cameras and that one chip has one enable signal coming into it. So regardless of which camera you turn on, both cameras get supplied power from that chip. And I've ran into them before where after this repair all of a sudden whenever you go to turn the front camera on that LDO don't get switched on. It's like why isn't that being turned on? It's turned on. The PMIC sends the signal to the LDO that, that su supplies that power. And it comes on whenever you turn the back camera on. And you can detect power at the front camera when the back camera's on. But when you go to use the front camera, it doesn't get power. I haven't figured that one out. There's, there's a couple of problems with this repair that I haven't figured out yet. Um, I've only ran into that problem once. 
out of a hundred, maybe more. And anytime I wind up with a front camera that don't work, I have I you know I wind up refloating a handful of these components right next to the connector for the front camera, and and we're good. It fixes it. Um, I'm a little bit of a head cold today. So here's what this looks like right now after the job. I got flux all over everything. Now I know a lot of shops are sending this out with flux on it because they wind up here. And that chip quick 291, I don't know, it might be okay to leave on the board, but I sure in the hell am not leaving that on the board. My next step is ultrasonic cleaning. So no way in hell I'll do this cheaper. Um, it's really hard to not do it for more, especially when I have a day where three to five of them, almost all of them, have a secondary issue that I have to deal with, and that, that's a real pain in my neck. So the first Touch IC video that I recorded, I talked like I wasn't having these issues. Well, that's because I was doing five or six of them per week. Now I'm doing five or six per day, sometimes more. Um, I've sent as many of these out of here as 30 in a week. And so I'm really getting a good taste of some of these other problems. And I'm also just realizing that even Apple themselves, Apple themselves right off the assembly line had to have had flickering gray bars. There must have been a certain percentage of the iPhone, especially the iPhone 6 Plus, there must have been a certain percentage of the iPhone 6 Plus that had to go back for some sort of a rework for a revision right off the assembly line. These people seen these gray bars. This isn't something that just magically started popping up a year later or two or whatever, however long it's been. Um, and knowing after, the, after you replace those ICs, sometimes you'll put it in a housing and have the gray bars immediately. Replace the ICs again and then it's fixed. So. Apple themselves had to have had issues with this. I, I know they did. I mean, I don't know. Maybe they didn't, but seriously, come on. The next step on this repair is ultrasonic cleaning. Now, when I'm doing this and I'm not doing a video, <laughs> it's, it, it, it's nuts. I'm doing five to seven at a time, and I wind up doing a, a certain order here. And as I'm getting done here, they're shuffling across to the ultrasonic cleaner, which I'm going to do now. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ultrasonic clean this board. I'm at 55 degrees C. The first video I did, I told you that I was going to ultrasonic clean it for 30 seconds. Sorry, I do not have a camera on the ultrasonic cleaner. It's, you know, you know, one day I'll probably get this all rigged up so that I got cameras on everything and make this really cool for you guys. But as it is right now, our, our shop is so busy, I can't hardly see straight. Um, and it's difficult to find time to do any of this on camera. Um, now I got some older videos that I found that I made and I never uploaded because I was worried that I would just get laughed at. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and hesitantly publish some of those. Alright, so I just passed 20 seconds and I'm sidetracked. I normally do 30 seconds on one side and 30 seconds on the other, but... Seven, six, five... Four, three, two, one. All right, the board's out of the cleaner. I'm gonna try to get rid of as much water as I can. I'm switching to an air compressor here really really soon next week or two I'm spending a fortune on compressed there it's ridiculous all right get rid of as much water as I can to try to keep from polluting my alcohol bath and then the next thing I'm doing I don't even know if you'll be able to see it but I'm dipping the same part of the board in this alcohol and I'm giving it time to seep in and weasel its way in under all the chips I try not to let it just sit there and soak, but really I want to use the alcohol to try to displace as much water from or ultrasonic cleaning solution as I can. All right. First can. <laughs>
I don't know how well I've done getting my point across in this video. It's I got a lot on my mind today. I got some st stuff going on later on today that I'm really, really not looking forward to. But um, anyways, I'm keeping my head up, and I'm using this morning to make video. Well, I've had quite a few people asking me. All right, so here we are after ultrasonic cleaning. Yeah, there's a couple little spots on the uh, IC itself. Audio IC always looks a little grungy. Um, you know, a lot of times if this is going back to another shop, um, I'll go add one little extra touch here, and I'll go ahead and clean off the top of these ICs. That way, if they look at it, they open the phone, and they pull the sticker off the board or what have you, and look at the IC, they'll go, damn. Because honestly, when I'm done with these, um, you can't tell I've been here. These things are so clean when I'm done that when you open one of these, you know, pull the sticker off and look at the board, even me, myself, with my own eyes looking under the microscope, I don't have any way to tell that this chip has been replaced. It does not look like it's been replaced. Okay, so that's going to be it for this video. My next step is to lay this board on the hot plate. I have this thing set for 250 degrees Fahrenheit, which the thermostat don't work. So I have this little alarm here that I set for 250 Fahrenheit. And if for any reason I forget about this, so I don't toast a customer's board, the alarm goes batshit crazy and it lets me know, hey, you forgot about something important. So um, I'm approaching the end of this video here. I now have this board on the dryer. Um, I'm going to try to recap here really quick my main points of this video. Um, I talked quite a bit about the defect rate, you know, anywhere from 5 to 10 percent, sometimes less. I wouldn't say anytime more. I mean, um, I've got a really, really good success rate on this repair. But for all of you asking me if I'm going to underfill it, if I'm going to put the shield on there, I'm just, I'm not. Um, those things are going to come back no matter what I do. Um, I've tested it. It's a fact. I, I just, I know that that's not making any difference. So um, there's my, two of my main points, underfill, shield. Uh, my other main point is that with the volume of this repair that's coming through here, I'm very sorry I cannot offer you a high volume discount because I, I just, why would I do a whole lot more work for less money whenever there's already so many of them that, it, that it's really hard for me to get through? So um, I just, I can't. Um, that's going to be it for this video. Uh, I don't know if you all learned something or not. I just wanted to run through one of these really quick and show my updated method of doing this. Um, the next time I run into a micro jumper situation, I'm probably going to go ahead and do a live micro jumper only video. Not, not live. I ain't live streaming right now. I got too much going on. And there's no way I could sit there and look at the chat like Rossman does and stuff. And his shop closes and then he starts a live stream and it's like, I've got the passion. I, I, I can understand where that would come from. When it gets toward the end of the day, I'm not ready to just run from this place. I'm ready to keep learning and, and keep driving. But I have a family to take care of. Um, so whenever it's time to walk away from the shop, I have to walk away from the shop and, and be with my family. So... Um, when the time comes and I'm going to do, the next time I run into a micro jumper situation on one of these touch ICs, I'm going to go ahead and do that on camera. Because some of the botched repair rescues I've been getting coming in here, um, they've actually got a lot of missing pads under Cumulus. People are changing Cumulus and not touching Mason. Whatever. Um, so I'd like to show how it is that I'm running those jumpers, but I'm going to be a little bit embarrassed because you'll finally get to see just how bad my tweezers are for doing micro jumpers. But hey, I make it work. So um, anyways, that's it for this video. I hope all of you have successful repairs, and I hope my repairs today are successful. We'll see how it goes. Thanks for watching, everybody.